Now we know the basics about signals. We know a bit about antennas. Now we let the signals fly into space. What happens? Well, the closer you are to a sender, the better the signal quality is. The signal is stronger. That's quite obvious. The far away you are, the weaker the signal is. We can distinguish three different ranges. First of all, we have a transmission range. Transmission range, that means the communication is possible. You have a relatively low error rate. So if you're here somewhere, then you can easily transmit and receive data. Okay, that's fine. That's exactly what we need for wireless communication. If you're a bit further away, there's a so-called detection range. That means at least you will see, uh -huh, there's something going on but the signal is too weak to communicate. But you still see there is some wireless transmission. This will be important later on when we discuss medium access mechanisms. Then we need this detection range that at least we hear, ah, I don't understand what's going on, but at least there is something going on. And finally, we have a so-called interference range. That means you cannot even detect that there is a signal but this signal at least adds to a certain background noise. So you, you cannot really say, okay, this is a wireless LAN signal or a cellular base station, but there's some background noise. And then sure, there's something around this interference range where you do not even have the noise from this sender. Well, big, big warning. This figure is a bit misleading because in reality, the transmission range is rather something like this bizarre shaped figure, also detection range, etc., and so on. And these bizarre figures, they even vary their shape over time. This depends on if you move in space, weather, other persons, etc., etc. Many, many other effects, effects for the propagation of signals. So in vacuum, it would look like this figure with a nice sphere. For this is the transmission range, detection range, interference range. That's it. But in real life, it looks different. Why? Let's have a look on signal propagation without going into details. In free space, if you have antenna, the signal travels a straight line, usually. We're not talking about gravitational lenses, things like this, but so straight line. Even in vacuum, the received power is proportional to one divided by the squared distance. Well, we do not have any other attenuation, but the distance. So let's say the energy we have in a signal, let's say it's the thickness of the rubber of a balloon. And if you really pump air into the balloon, the balloon it's larger, larger, larger and larger. That means the rubber is thinner, thinner and thinner and thinner spread over the whole surface. So in real environments, well, it's rather well, much higher, the attenuation, because you have in a real environment, you do not only have buildings and trees, but also water, the atmosphere, people, etc. So that's already quite a lot. So, in real life, if you have your base station somewhere with your antenna, that means if you just move away, let's say instead of one meter or let's say 10 meters to the base station, you move away for another 10 meter. Well, that's not only half the signal strength, that's, well, really a lot lower depending on well if there's something in between and even if there's nothing in between just the air it's way lower and that means just a practical example that if you move just some meters more away from a base station the signal strength drops dramatically that also means that the received signal from any base station 
so if you might be afraid of base stations, is way, way, way lower. Like picowatts or even less compared to the smartphone you hold close to your body. Because the distance is the big factor. Okay, so if you double the distance vacuum, you have only a fourth of the signal strength and way less in real environments. Besides that, you have many more influences. You have different effects depending on the frequencies, fading effects depending on frequencies you will see. Like, well, I give you the example. There's no sunlight shining through a concrete wall, but through a window made out of glass. Well, that's frequency depending fading. You have shadowing and walls, you have reflections. Well, reflections, that's a good idea. If you have, for example, your mobile phone down there on the street and the base station is somewhere else. So you need the reflection, otherwise uh, you will not receive anything. So it's very rare that you have a line of sight to the base station. Refraction, other effects. If you look into water of the sea, you see these refraction effects. So you look into the water and you have this effect that the objects are in a different position. You see them at a different positions compared to where they really are. Scattering effect, diffraction effect, etc. depending on the frequencies, on the size of the obstacles. These are exactly the effects you saw, for example, if I had a laser beam at school and it went through this very, very narrow gap and you, had, you then saw these nice patterns behind this. So interference uh, uh, with two gaps and things you did with laser beams at high school. With minimum and maximum and you calculate all these things. So the same effects you saw there with light or x-rays with the structure of crystals. You see here with the radio waves of cellular phone systems. So this gets quite complicated. And then if you look at real examples, it really looks a bit bizarre. Let's start at the right hand side. That's the Rhine Valley. And there are mountains, black forest. And if you have an antenna up there on top of one of the mountains of the black forest, you see these patterns, the radio waves as they go down and then they're reflected up into the air. You also see something like a shadow down there. Yes, it's like a shadow, shadow from the radio wave. That's the lighthouse effect. If you have a lighthouse and you have a bright light up there, everything is in bright light here, but you have standing close to the lighthouse, it's dark. That's also a reason why having a mobile base station on your roof of your house that means, well, not a good signal quality for you, but for the other side of the street. Okay, so you see how these patterns look like, or example, downtown Munich. You see the effects of buildings here, huge churches, etc. They really cast a shadow. That means if you plan your mobile phone system, you know exactly, aha, uh -huh, I definitely need another base station up here, etc., etc. Well, in reality, you need many more. But also for a, a wireless LAN that's uh, flat somewhere, you have a hotspot, you see what happens Why like the radio waves go into a room, but you have larger areas where you might need something like a wireless LAN repeater dark spots here and you see how the waves are reflected etc how they might even go outside the building all these things so this gives you a good impression why your wireless LAN at home does not really work in all the rooms oh yes there are walls open doors closed doors there might be some other people absorbing the energy and so on so this all has to be considered when planning your cellular network, your wireless LAN hotspots, your radio broadcast stations, etc. 
So now we looked at the signal, or the single path, a single signal path. But what you see from these examples already, there's not only a single path. For example, if you look at one of these points in here, you see they receive signals from this way or from that way or reflected, etc. And this leads us to multipath propagation. So a signal can take many different paths between a sender and a receiver due to all these effects like reflection, scattering, etc. The example here shown are only three different paths. One, two down here and three. Number three is our line of sight in this example. One is reflected, there's a building, two might be scattered or whatever. What happens? In real life, we have many, many, many an arbitrary number of paths, but here we show only three for this example. First of all, if we send on the left hand side a signal, here it's just this peak. So we have this peak, a signal. First of all, this is received via the line of sight, is this peak. And then again, it's received via, let's say, Num the path number two and then path number one, something like this, depending on the distances. So maybe three, two, one, whatever. The first effect you see is the first pulse you see is a line of sight. And then you might see some more pulses reflecting the different paths. It could be also the case that the line of sight is weaker and the uh, next pulse is stronger, for example, if in the line of sight there's water. That's the shortest path, the line of sight is always the shortest path, but the reflection is stronger because there's no water in between, no tree, no whatever, could be the case. So it's not always that the line of sight is the strongest one, but it's the first one. Okay, you see, this single peak on the center side is dispersed over time. So the signal is dispersed, time dispersion. The signal re reaches the receiver directly and phase shifted. So shifted in phase. Okay, you might think, so what is the problem? Well, what happens if you send two signals, signal one and signal two? Then it might happen that the clearly at the sender side, sender side clearly separated signals start overlapping. You see here an overlap of the line of sight pulse of signal two with one of the paths of signal one. And this type of interference might lead to a cancellation of the signal. So the signals interfere, they can, well, destroy each other. So at least we have kind of a distorted signal depending on the phase, depending on the distances, on the whole setting. And the result is so-called intersimple interference. So clearly separated symbols on the sender side will suddenly interfere with each other. So what does it mean for us? We are in computer science, we want to transmit bits, many bits per second. But this many bits per second also means many symbols per second. The symbols represent one or several bits. So the more bits we want to transmit per second, the more symbols we have to transmit per second, the closer the symbol R's are to each other on the sender side. The closer the symbols are, the higher the chances that they overlap on the receiver. So multipath propagation causes intersymbol interference. How much interference? Well, this depends on where the multipaths are, etc. So multipath propagation, that's a problem. It's also a chance we will see receivers that can use multipath propagation with different antennas and then add the different phases in a constructive way, for example. 
What else do we have? We want to be mobile. We have a wireless system. We want to be mobile. So that means the channel characteristics change over time and location. So the signal paths, you just saw the multiple paths, they change over time. So we have different delays of different signal part and the delays, they vary in time. So, and these changes can happen in a very fast manner. Very quick changes in the received power. This is then called fast fading or short term fading. So short term fading means that, for example, if you move your car just some centimeters, so you have suddenly complete different signal strength because the same signal might overlap with itself, traveling different paths. So a signal might cancel out. So that's, that's one of the problems. You so say you will have a minimum and a maximum. Think again back, high school physics, you saw this, minimum, maxima. This also happens with acoustic uh, waves. Uh, minimum and maximum, depending on where you are in the room. But also here in electromagnetic waves, so you have this fast fading. So while moving, you will reach a maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum. And the difference between maximum and minimum might be just some centimeters. Because this depends pretty much on your wave length, which is also in this range of centimeters. Additionally, you have, might have a different distance to the center over time. There might be some obstacles further away. So you also have some slow changes in average power, slow fading. So what can you do? With fast fading, it's very difficult to adapt. Because if you're traveling with a car, this can be ultra fast. So whew, uh, very difficult. So maybe you can do something like forward error correction, so you can code some redundancy in your data so that, that you can still recover the data, but it's difficult. So uh, you can use different modulation schemes that you can at least uh, receive something, some parts, we'll see examples for this. For the slow fading, you can adapt your transmit power. So you can check the receive power and then depending on the receive power, you can adapt your sending power or the base station can give you a hint. So increase your transmit power, no, low, lower the transmit power so that you can adapt. So there are different control schemes, so-called open or closed loop, etc. control schemes in use. We will not go into these details, but you should remember for slow fading, it's easier to adapt. Also for faster fading, there are some more schemes you can also adapt there. So, some questions just for the signal propagation. What are the main problems? Why can't those waves not always follow the straight line? You saw some examples. And think of reflection. This can be very useful. So I showed you some examples from real world, but still we miss something. What do we miss? What else could influence the signal propagation? Because you saw there's a valley, there are walls, there are buildings. What is missing there? Think of multipath propagation. Can we benefit from it? How? Are there some ideas? What can we do? So ISI mitigation, um, yeah, what can we do? How does this depend on symbol rate, on the motion, your send and receiver moves? Uh, what can we do there? And in the next chapter, we will talk about multiplexing schemes. And then you can come back to this question. Um, if we do this time division multiplexing and we have ISI, what are the influences? If you are not, you know, you're not really, you don't have sound knowledge in all these, well, waves and all these uh, things, do go back to physics, to these propagation patterns of lasers and uh, then you will remember, ah, exactly. So there was something, if we have this small gap in the laser beam, so what actually can create this kind of short-term fading besides reflections and there are some nice other effects. And what can you do against it? Fast fading, slow fading, you can look up in literature. There are several uh, means what you can do against.